Hello class. Uh, so in our meeting on uh, week three, Tess reviewed some of the library resources and uh, this week we're going to talk a little bit about the types and contents of most academic essays as well as some advice for how to read them for maximum efficiency and understanding. Uh, you'll be reading hundreds of articles from peer-reviewed academic journals during your time here at Richmond. Um, they will be reading for class, uh, for your assigned readings, as well as sources for your papers and research projects. Probably 70 to 80 percent of your sources for your papers will be articles from peer-reviewed academic journals at least. And uh, most academic articles fall into one of a few broad categories and contain basically the same structure and components. So once you recognize that, reading and understanding them will be somewhat easier. First, what does peer review mean and why is it important? The peer review process is the quality control for academic journals. Just like its name implies, in peer review, an article will be read and carefully considered by hand-picked experts in the author's field before it's published. So every field has its own best practices and every publication is different. But in general, an article published in a peer-reviewed academic journal will have gone through three distinct steps or filters. First, it will have been reviewed by an editorial team of the journal, who as a rule are subject matter experts. This team will reject the stupid papers, papers with obvious flaws in the experimental methodologies or deficiencies in the structure or argument or lots of typos, stuff like that. And if the paper makes it through this step, it goes on to a blind review process where it will be read and evaluated by a number of hopefully unbiased subject matter experts. In the behavioral sciences, normally at least three or four outside experts will evaluate the quality of the paper. These experts will carefully review every aspect of the paper, uh, especially focusing on the quality of the research, whether the methods employed are rigorous and whether the conclusions follow from the observations. This review is blind in that it is conducted by people who don't know the author or the paper personally, supposedly, and is intended to be as objective and unbiased as possible. If a paper survives this step, and not many do, it will kind of enter the revision process where changes and revisions will be suggested to the original author based on the original review. The idea is that in this multi-step process, bad ideas or flawed or redundant conclusions will be uh, filtered out and only the best stuff will be published. Uh, only the best research will uh, be published, supposedly in a peer-reviewed academic journal. Uh, and why is this important? So think of all the stuff that's published on human behavior every year. Uh, think of all the books of pop psychology and self-improvement, self-help books, television shows like Dr. Phil, YouTube videos, blog posts, journalism, etc. Some of this stuff might be helpful, thoughtful, and based on uh, empirical research. Uh, some might be anodyne or harmless, but a lot will be bullcrap. It'll be wrong, it'll be harmful, it'll be outdated, sometimes it'll be even deranged or just absolutely insane. You know, the reason for this is, of course, that anybody can publish a blog post. And many non-academic publishers are not terribly scrupulous, even major uh, book publishers. They just want to move copies. And if a book on narcissism by some flavor of the month guru sells, they'll publish it. Journalists and non-specialists might try to get things right. And if they write for a major paper like the New York Times, they'll at least have the benefit of a fact-checking department. However, they're not trained in the field of behavioral science. And they often exaggerate, simplify, or misrepresent published research. Science and psychology journalism is famous for these kinds of misrepresentations. If you get your information about human behavior and psychology from even reputable journalistic sources, you'll likely end up with a skewed, simplistic, or insane understanding of what the research actually says. Uh, these are not, in general, the kinds of sources that you'll want to use to support your argument. In general, you want to use articles from peer-reviewed academic uh, journals to support your conclusions because peer review provides some measure of uh, assurance that what you are citing has at least been uh, evaluated and passed by a board of experts in that particular field. That doesn't mean that you should turn off your critical thinking or that you should accept uncritically everything you read in an academic journal. It just means that certain quality control uh, uh, steps have been taken uh, to ensure uh, the quality of uh, what's, been, uh, what's been published. So by referencing peer-reviewed research in your papers, you'll be reassuring your 
audience, that you're not just relying on hearsay or shoddy secondary sources, but only citing material which has been rigorously tested and evaluated by experts in the field. Again, it might be wrong. Again, you should critically evaluate it, but at least peer review provides some assurance that you've done your research in the right way. Okay. So, okay, those were the stages of peer review. There's an editorial stage where the magazine, you know, accepts or rejects uh, submitted research uh, based on its, you know, immediate uh, quality. Then there's a blind review stage where experts in the field outside of the publication review the research and, you know, use their own expertise to kind of determine its qualities. And then they suggest uh, revisions to that original research, uh, to that paper. Uh, and so that even a really good paper, which presents original research conducted in a rigorous manner, will still generally be revised uh, with the assistance of experts. You know, maybe they forgot to include a, a particularly relevant source, uh, you know, or their literature review is, is, is not quite sufficient, or maybe their conclusions are a little bit too broad or sweeping. The revision stage is uh, what ensures that uh, an article has been uh, uh, edited, just like you would edit your own papers, edit and revise your own papers. Uh, papers that are published by professionals in the behavioral sciences will also be go through an editing and revision process uh, with the help of outside experts. Okay, so peer-reviewed journals publish all kinds of things, but in general, most academic essays you'll be consulting will fall into one of several different categories. You'll have empirical research, which is research which employs observation and experimentation to arrive at conclusions. So this is the most common type you'll encounter generally in a uh, psychology journal. It, it, there are articles which employ some kind of observation to uh, drive empirical research. Empirical just means based on observation. Then sometimes you'll have theoretical articles uh, which will attempt to define a certain approach to a subject, uh, the basic philosophical assumptions of a theory for instance, and how this abstract theory might be brought to bear on certain concrete situations or applications. So a theoretical article might reference empirical research, but it doesn't present new experimental data on its own. And finally, you'll have lit reviews, which review the state of research on a given topic in different levels of detail. Of course, journals publish other kinds of things too. They publish book reviews, they publish letters to the editor, they publish editorials, but these are less important to you here. Sometimes a book review might be useful to determine the value of a potential source. They're very useful to us librarians uh, when we're trying to, trying to decide which books to add uh, to the collection. Uh, but in general, uh, these are the three kinds of things that, which get published in academic journals, which you'll use to support your research. Roughly speaking, uh, empirical research is going to fall into two basic categories, qualitative or quantitative studies. These measure different things. A qualitative study will seek to quantify, a, a quantitative study will seek uh, to uh, <laughs> seek to quantify a certain phenomenon, such as what, what is the R value or correlation coefficient between, say, adolescent depression and social media use. Uh, quantitative studies usually try to ruthlessly eliminate as many outside variables as possible in order to increase the certainty and rigor of their conclusions. Uh, they're more likely then to take place in carefully controlled laboratory settings and to use um, use methodologies such as surveys or uh, questionnaires, something that which can be uh, uh, analyzed quantitatively and provide a number uh, uh, indicating a certain, a certain kind of relationship. Uh, the goal of uh, most quantitative studies is to extrapolate or generalize from the observations made on a very limited sample size uh, to the entire population. Quantitative research attempts to give precise answers to precise questions, uh, and these answers tend to be broadly generalizable to the rest of the population. On the other hand, a qualitative study in the behavioral sciences uh, is more of an uh, observation of a specific case. It doesn't work so hard to eliminate complexity or make broad generalizations about the world based on a relatively small sample size. A qualitative study is more concerned about the experience of a phenomenon. Questions like, 
what is it like to recover from anorexia as a teenager? Or uh, what are the experiences of rural Appalachian families who have lost a loved one to methamphetamine addiction? Or how do immigrants from South Asia experience the immigration process? Qualitative studies rely on observation and interviews with individuals, on transcripts from those interviews, on focus groups, on personal accounts and narratives. Um, you often see qualitative studies called case studies where a uh, researcher will drill down on a very specific, uh, maybe an individual. Uh, there are a lot of very famous case studies of individuals in psychology uh, where a uh, researcher will examine closely the case of a single uh, patient or client uh, in the therapeutic process and examine by examining their behavior uh, will try to come up with some conclusion about you know human nature or the nature of human uh, behavior uh, but uh, in general whereas quantitative studies will employ methods that you know produce a number such as questionnaires or surveys or laboratory observations a qualitative study is going to sort of more embrace the complexity of what it means to experience a certain thing uh, it's going to rely more on the uh, uh, on the eyewitness account of a uh, particular person or particular members of a of a population so qualitative studies generally employ a small carefully chosen group to observe whereas quantitative studies in order to avoid the appearance of bias tend to go with larger sample sizes in order to achieve a higher level of objectivity and those samples the samples used in a quantitative study tend to be randomized so a qualitative study doesn't generally rely on a random sample uh, you know they're looking for specific individuals uh, specific populations with specific stories whereas a quantitative study uh, to avoid bias to avoid skewed results is going to look is going to try to randomize uh, the uh, uh, their sample group so there are all kinds of research questions empirical studies seek to answer. Uh, there are basic existence questions, for instance, does X exist? There are description questions such as what are the basic social characteristics of binge drinkers or what are the parenting styles of American men suffering from depression? Uh, there can be relationship questions such as is openness to new ideas related to educational attainment? Uh, what is the relationship uh, between these two different phenomenons? Uh, there are comparison questions such as do women live longer than men and questions about causality such as does dialectical behavior therapy improve outcomes for teenagers uh, suffering from alcohol addiction or does social media cause narcissism? Questions about causality are especially relevant when it comes to determining the efficacy of a therapeutic practice or treatment. So aside from empirical research you'll read a number of theoretical articles which don't themselves present new research but generally draw upon existing research in order to critique an existing theoretical approach or demonstrate how it might apply to a specific situation or specific treatment methodology or to advance an entire new theory or model to explain a certain phenomenon these theoretical models will be tested by future empirical studies and often a theoretical article will uh, act as kind of the launch point for uh, further research, kind of an invitation for future research. And finally, literature reviews. You'll be writing one of these. Literature reviews attempt to synthesize the relevant research on a particular topic and they kind of differ by what's the scope of the literature reviewed. So a narrative review is the kind you'll be writing for this class. A narrative review uh, often forms the introduction to an empirical study. Uh, they provide the context that they say for a particular topic. What's the state of the question? Uh, who else has written about uh, this particular topic? What have other researchers said about this particular topic? Empirical studies will often begin with this kind of short literature review to set the stage for and prove the importance of the new research they're about to present in their article. Narrative literature reviews are topical and fairly broad. They won't include every single article on the subject, just the most important ones. They may or may not have a particular research question they're trying to answer or a conclusion they're trying to prove. Other types of literature reviews, such as scoping reviews, systematic literature reviews, and meta-analyses, attempt to be a little bit more comprehensive than a narrative review. A narrative review mostly hits the high points, mostly only includes the most important research in a given field, and is generally tries to sum up that research in a way that's readable and uh, uh, interesting and uh, helpful without being exhaustive. 
A scoping review is kind of the next step up, and you'll read scoping reviews. They'll be assigned to you uh, in your other classes. A scoping review is generally trying to answer the question of what is the extent of current research on a given topic? What's the scope of current research on a given topic? Uh, is more research needed? If so, what kind? Uh, scoping reviews often serve as kind of the springboard for, for future research by identifying gaps in the current literature on a topic and recommending next steps. Uh, they point out possible directions for future research to take. Systematic literature reviews go further, generally, than scoping literature reviews. Systematic reviews attempt to identify all the relevant research on a given topic and to analyze it very carefully. Systematic reviews have careful criteria for what studies will be included and what studies will not be included. And very often, a systematic review will attempt to answer a particular question based on the synthesis of all the available research. Now, questions like uh, what we just talked about, existence and description questions, relationship questions, causality questions. A, uh, sorry, uh, a systematic literature review, instead of using empirical observation to arrive at a conclusion, might analyze a bunch of different uh, pieces of research, a bunch of different uh, pieces of empirical observations in order to arrive at a conclusion about the efficacy of a certain treatment or the characteristics of a certain population or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the question might be similar, the question that it's trying to answer might be similar to the question that you'd find in an empirical study, such as based on all the relevant current research, what is the efficacy of group therapy in treating people with self-harming tendencies? Instead of looking directly at people with self-harming tendencies in group therapy, a um, systematic literature review will just review a bunch of research on this particular population and issue and try to come to a conclusion based on synthesizing all that different research and uh, evaluating it carefully. And then finally, a meta-analysis is like the quantitative version of a systematic literature review. Uh, it attempts to synthesize a body of research and quantify the results of that research using statistical analysis and statistical measures. Uh, you'll probably re be reading all kinds of literature reviews in your research for this class and for others. Uh, professors really like to assign them uh, for the same reason they like to assign textbooks. A good literature review is going to synthesize and evaluate a very large body of research for students looking to know more about a topic. You may not have time to read dozens or even hundreds of articles that have, which have been written on a topic. Thankfully, the author of a literature review has done that for you and has you know, brought out the high points or brought out the important conclusions or made important observations about the state of the current research. Uh, so a good lit review brings together all the research conducted on a topic along with expert commentary and evaluation. And that's why they're very valuable to you as students conducting research and uh, why your professors like to assign them. They make it easy to learn a lot about a topic, a lot about the state of a particular topic in a relatively short amount of time. And they're also really great for finding references. If you're looking for all the relevant research published on a given topic, reading the references on a few literature reviews is not a bad place to start because literature reviews try to be fairly comprehensive and, uh, you know, at least including all the important sources or important pieces of research uh, by seeing what pieces of uh, research uh, a literature review has included on a particular topic, you can find a great deal, you can often find a list of all the relevant sources, all the relevant research, or at least a lot of the relevant research which has been published. Okay, moving on. So, most academic articles follow more or less the same format and structure, no matter what category they fall into. First, you'll have the title and the title page with uh, all the publication information you'll use to put a reference together, date, uh, DOI, the name of the journal, the issue and the volume number, etc. Uh, you'll also find information about who the authors are and where they work, what their institutional affiliations are, uh, what schools they might teach at or where their research was conducted, who paid for that research. Uh, the title tends to be dry and specific and informative, at least with scientific writing, so that it's easy, they're easier to find. Uh, relevant articles are easier to find for somebody looking for current research. Uh, after that, you'll have an abstract. Uh, an abstract is a summary of an article in about 150 words or so. It's just a handful of sentences. It's not meant to evaluate the quality of the research. So, you know, it'd be kind of uh, silly if somebody put in their abstract, you know, this 
outstanding research or this groundbreaking uh, uh, research, you know, finds that finds a relationship between such and such and such and such. Uh, an abstract doesn't evaluate the quality of an article. It's just meant to, you know, define the problem to be solved or the question to be answered. It's meant to summarize the current state of the research in like a sentence. It's meant to define the priorities and methodologies of your own research. So if you wrote an abstract to a paper, you talk briefly, you know, for like a sentence about what the problem is. You talk for like a sentence or two about uh, what other people are saying about the problem. You talk for a sentence or two about the priorities and methodologies of your own research. Uh, you'd outline your findings and conclusions and discuss the implications. The abstract is basically a 150 word summary of uh, your paper. Uh, you will sometimes write abstracts for other classes, not this class, I don't think, uh, but you, you will get some practice writing abstracts in your later classes at Richmond. So much of the time when you're looking for sources for your papers and projects, uh, all you'll read is the abstract and title to figure out if a piece of research is going to be useful to you. Uh, an abstract is often the only thing that your reader is going to read of a paper. Uh, they're just going to be skimming the title and the abstract to see, hey, does, does this research seem relevant to my topic? Or, hey, does this research uh, seem helpful in my own clinical practice? And if they read the abstract, they can make kind of an educated guess about whether or not, you know, what the scope of the article is, what kind of question it's trying to answer, you know, is it going to be helpful to me? Okay, so then you have the introduction, which often functions as a kind of mini narrative literature review. Um, it, they kind of summarize what the other people are saying in the field at the moment or the state of uh, research into a particular subject. As you re read in Graf and Birkenstein, you start with a they say before adding your own ideas to the discussion. And academic writing follows the same basic template. The introduction is normally an extended they say. Uh, then you have your methodology section. In an empirical study, a method section will will focus on how a phenomenon was studied, what methods were employed, surveys or interviews or direct laboratory observation or rats and mazes, whatever, uh, what the sampling criteria were, uh, how the uh, test subjects were chosen, uh, what the safeguards were to prevent bias or to prevent the results from being skewed, and uh, all the details about the parameters under which a study was conducted. Whereas with a lit review, a method study will discuss the selection criteria for which research is included in the study and which is left out. Uh, methodology sections tend to be the densest and most technical parts of a paper, uh, but they're this way on purpose. A methodology section allows future research to replicate the study themselves, so it has to be as detailed as possible. A method section is a way of ensuring accountability, then, of being transparent, uh, as transparent as possible, so that other researchers can go back and recreate the experiment. Uh, so that uh, a, the one reason why a methodology section is so dry is because it has to contain a bunch of technical details uh, so that people can know under what conditions the experiment was uh, uh, was performed and sometimes uh, maybe I should try it maybe I should maybe I should see if these results are really you know really true so uh, you know I, I need information on how to replicate this particular study or this particular experiment uh, the methodology section will also generally contain, contain a precise statement of the research hypothesis or the question which the research is try, researcher is trying to answer. Following the method section, you'll have a results section, which is where the numbers from a quantitative study are presented, or relevant extracts from interviews in a qualitative study, uh, or the research summarized by a literature review. And then finally, you'll have a discussion section where the uh, implications of the results are contextualized and discussed a little bit. Uh, discussion over whether the original hypothesis was confirmed or not, and uh, also possible suggestions for future research, future future articles. And then you'll have the reference section, uh, and then you'll have appendices. Often the appendices will include like the questionnaire or the uh, survey used in a particular study, or it, it'll include full transcripts of the interviews, or it'll include charts or tables or... Uh, uh, conflict of interest statements, just stuff that's useful but doesn't fit into the main body of the paper. Okay, so as probably most of you are realizing or have realized, academic journals are not the most riveting things to read in the world. 
Uh, they are often packed to the gills with jargon, with technical terminology, and uh, dry, uh, dispassionate, um, objective accounts of different research methodologies and conclusions. So it's very easy to become discouraged or bogged down while trying to read them. Uh, I've read hundreds of these kinds of articles, and often about halfway through, I'll arrive at a point where I kind of realize that I no longer understand what the article is saying, and that I've never had the slightest idea of what the article is trying to demonstrate. Uh, this is really d discouraging, at least it was for me, you know, to have to start all over again uh, and force yourself to get through it. Uh, but it's what will most likely happen to you guys if you don't develop a clear methodology for how to quickly and efficiently read a research paper. So the problem gets even worse when you realize that for every research project you complete at Ridgemont, you might have to review dozens of articles. So you don't have the time to laboriously plow through each and every sentence of each and every paper, or you'll become exhausted and bored before you even start writing. So you will need to practice how to read and digest a great deal of dry technical material in a thorough and efficient manner. Most people assume they already know how to read. After all, you've been reading uh, since you were very young. But if you pick up a scientific article and start from the beginning and plow through it sentence by sentence to the conclusion with the expectation that you will remember everything after a single pass, you will feel defeated. So the method I'm going to recommend is something that I've stolen from uh, Srinivasan uh, Keshav at the University of Waterloo, as well as from Paul Edwards at the University of Michigan. I posted both articles in this week's reading because I think uh, that both articles are very helpful, even though their methods differ significantly. Uh, but uh, you can kind of pick whether you like Edwards' method better or whether you like Keshav's method better. Uh, but I think it's important just to stick with a methodology. Uh, the methodology is known as the three-pass approach. And the basic idea is that instead of trying to pick up a, a book or an article and uh, remember everything on a single go, it's actually faster and easier and more efficient to read an article in three distinct passes. On the first pass, you'll try to get a sense of the overall argument of the paper or chapter or book. You know, you'll try to answer questions about what is it about? Uh, what's the basic structure of the argument? Uh, what's the basic research methodology employed? What type of article is this? Uh, what are the conclusions? On a second pass, you'll read it much more carefully and investigate the arguments and evidence presented and kind of try to sift through the key points and evaluate them somewhat yourself using your critical reading uh, skills. And on the third and final pass, you'll review and digest what you've just read and take careful notes and try to reflect on the arguments. Uh, so we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but first, just a few basic uh, pointers. I think it's important to take notes and to create citations as you go for each source uh, as you read. Uh, this will help save you time when it comes time to write your paper. Often if you create a correct citation from the very beginning, you won't have to go back to the source to create your reference for it later when you use it in the paper. I like using a Google Doc uh, or a Word document uh, just to store all my uh, uh, citations and notes on those citations, uh, but you can also use a citation manager like Zotero and anything you use will save you time and help you find uh, your notes later when you really need them to write your paper. Uh, it's important of course uh, in your notes to be disciplined on quoting where you actually quote and on uh, paraphrasing carefully to be aware of plagiarism. Uh, it's very easy, probably maybe the most common way people plagiarize uh, is, you know, they're not meaning to. Maybe they just took notes and they, you know, quoted somebody without putting quotation marks around it. And then they use it in their paper later thinking it's a paraphrase when really it was a direct quote from uh, the source. So it's important to uh, just be disciplined even when you're taking notes uh, to mark where something's a quote and to... Uh, be careful when you paraphrase not to follow too closely. Uh, I think it's also important when you read a uh, academic article to set a time limit, uh, to recognize how much time you have to allocate to each resource and, and stick to it. You know, so one way to keep yourself from being bogged down is to set a little timer. Say, I'm going to, you know, work on this article for 30 minutes and when time's up, I'm going to move on. And uh, finally, you know, the basics of the three-pass approach is don't try to get everything on a single read-through. This will waste your time and energy and will lead to frustration. Okay, so uh, the basics of the three-pass approach. I think this method will help you understand what you read better and 
remember it more. Uh, I think you'll also play a more active role in the research process because you'll be actively reflecting on and consciously responding to the ideas presented and what you're reading. You're not just letting your eyes uh, drag across the page. I think this approach will also save you time. Often you'll discover on the first pass, uh, which may only take a few minutes, that the paper you're reading is not helpful for whatever reason. Maybe it's badly written or it's not relevant to your topic. Uh, it's better to know this right away than to spend a long time trudging through a very dense piece of research, taking detailed notes all the while, only to discover you're about three quarters of the way through once you hit to the results section that it's not going to be useful. This kind of thing is really fruitless and demoralizing and a waste of your precious time. And you don't get a lot of time in life or in grad school. Uh, <clears throat> so on the first pass, you're just trying to get a gist of the paper. And again, uh, for this approach, I'm uh, drawing heavily on Paul Edwards, and I'm drawing hev heavily on uh, uh, Keshav, uh, Keshav's uh, article, How to Read a Paper. I'll post them both in uh, this week's reading. But the first pass, you're just trying to get the gist. You'll read the title, you'll read the abstract, you'll read the headings, and the conclusion very carefully, but everything else will be skimmed. Uh, you'll skim the reference page, too, and note any sources that look interesting to you, maybe underlying sources that you think you might investigate further. Uh, the first pass should only take a few minutes, maybe 10, maybe 15 at most. Uh, you're answering five basic questions, according to Keshav. You're answering the question of category. What kind of paper is this? Remember the types we've gone over in today's lecture. Is it a literature review? Is it a quantitative study? Is it a qualitative study? So you know kind of what to expect. Uh, next, you're going to go for the cate for the context, the they say part. Who is the paper responding to? Who is the paper arguing with? Uh, what, whose research is the paper building on? What's the paper trying to measure or describe? What's the problem? Uh, what populations is uh, the paper dealing with? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, then correctness. Does the paper draw on strong current research? Is it relevant to your topic? Is the reasoning fallacious or stupid? Uh, are there obvious uh, flaws in the reasoning? Then you go for contribution. Uh, what does this paper add to the discussion? Uh, where does it go beyond current research? What is it trying to prove? Uh, how does it, uh, what's the, what's the I say part of the paper? What, the, what does this paper add? Um, that you might not get in other papers. And then finally, clarity. Is the paper well written? Is it easy to follow? Is it torture to try to get through? Uh, sometimes you'll read a paper, sometimes you'll have to read an important paper uh, that's torture to, torture to get through, and you'll have to use it as a source because it really is the best or only source on a particular question. Uh, but often the sign that a paper is just impossible to understand is, you know, maybe a warning sign to you to maybe look for different research, uh, maybe research that's a little bit more clear uh, or research that you can use a little bit more effectively in your paper. Remember, this first pass through the research shouldn't take much time, just a few minutes. Uh, be very aware of how much time you're spending on this step and don't take too much of it here. The only things you should be reading carefully are the abstract, the title, the introduction, the conclusion, and the headings. Everything else should be skimmed. Also, take a minute to look at the references and underline any which you think you might read later on. Uh, very often, I've read articles which were completely useless to me in my research, uh, but which contained really helpful references, uh, references that would later prove crucial. Very often, uh, the only useful thing about an article is going to be found on the reference page. So even if you don't think the article is useful, take a look at the references. Take a look at who the article is citing. Uh, at the very least, you'll get an idea about what kind of research is important, who the major voices are in this particular field, who's done the best research. So that's the first pass. By now, you'll have an understanding of the gist of the article as well as a sense of its usefulness, only after a few minutes. Again, you're just going to read the title, you're going to read the abstract, you're going to read the literature review, uh, you're going to read uh, uh, the conclusions, and you're just going to skim the headings, essentially, uh, and uh, look at the references. Okay, so the second pass is, uh, okay, so yeah, you're going to try to discover the article. Uh, uh, you're going to decide if the article is valuable, and if not, you stop at the first pass. Uh, it'll save you time. Uh, you spend 15 minutes not only trying to get the gist of an article, but also trying to get a sense of whether or not you're going to use that article later on. So on your second pass, uh, that's, that's what's going to take the most time. 
uh, 30 to 60 minutes for, for a normal academic article. And here you're going to read carefully, you're going to review any graphs or tables present, you're going to try to follow the argument step by step, um, paraphrasing in your notes, uh, you'll try to review any sources used, uh, you'll try to mark the ones that seem useful, you'll try to see how those sources have been used, uh, you're going to be trying to pick up all the threads. Uh, you're going to try to evaluate the evidence. You're going to try to follow the reasoning. Um, you're trying to read for understanding. So the first pass maps out the geography of the article. It gives you a blueprint uh, and an outline. And on the second pass, you're going to try to fill in that outline with more detail. Uh, you'll find it much easier to carefully read an article if you've already gotten the gist, if you've already gotten a uh, you know bird's eye view of the article, a broad uh, understanding and you know kind of know the main outline and where the articles headed uh, you also know by now now that you're investing real time and focus and understanding the article you'll know that you aren't wasting your time uh, you've already evaluated and seen that the article is worth reading before you sit down uh, and read it thoroughly and here uh, Keshav differs from Edward somewhat Keshav thinks of the third pass as an opportunity to just you know really drill down on an article and read it super closely even more closely than the second than the second pass and write very detailed notes uh, I think in general uh, I appreciate Edwards approach a little bit more Edwards thinks the third pass is you're reading for recollection you're going over everything one more time you can take in about 20 minutes try to remember the main points of the articles uh, you're trying to uh, make notes, you're trying to find the quotes that you think might be useful to your paper, uh, you're paraphrasing, um, you're writing a brief summary, uh, uh, and make sure also when you paraphrase and extract quotes, you also include page numbers so you can find them and reference them again. Uh, again, a citation manager like Zotero or a Google Doc will come in helpful to you here. I know some people like to take notes by hand. Uh, I found that electronically uh, it's a little bit easier to find notes and then of course you can copy and paste uh, your references or uh, quotes or uh, paraphrases into the body of your paper later uh, if you need to just you know of course be careful not to plagiarize um, but you know by putting the writer's main points into your own words on the third pass you'll remember and understand more and you'll have those paraphrases available to you when you need to write your paper so that's the method I'd suggest for how to read a large amount of dense technical material for maximum comprehension and retention in the minimum amount of time. Uh, I'd suggest practicing this method in your other classes, and at the very least, I'd suggest a two-pass method where you skim the entire article quickly before moving, uh, before reading more thoroughly later. Of course, you know, sometimes you'll just be assigned an article, and in this case, you'll have to do the, the you know, you'll have to read, read it thoroughly no matter what, but in your outside research and the research that you do for uh, your own projects, research papers, uh, the first pass is all about evaluating, uh, not just you know understanding the article, but evaluating whether or not you think it's going to be useful to you in your research. So anyway, sorry about how long that went, uh, uh, but uh, thanks for listening and sticking in, uh, hanging in there with me. Uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, for week four. Uh, I hope this is, this kind of broad overview of academic articles and how to read them is useful to you in uh, your analyzing an article assignment. Ciao.